Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another installment of Night Skies of Fort Collins. Um, if you, if this is your first time joining us for Night Skies of Fort Collins, my name is Ben Gondras, and I'm the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And it's my pleasure to bring this program to you each week to tell you a little bit about what you can find in the skies above Fort Collins at night. Um, there's a lot of amazing wonders to be seen in the night sky, and I hope to show you just a handful of things each and every week so that you can go out and find them for yourself uh, and, yeah, have a lot of fun doing that. Um, if you are watching from somewhere other than Fort Collins, don't worry. Everything that I show you tonight should be visible in your skies as well, as long as you're somewhere in the northern hemisphere. And with that said, we really love knowing where our viewers are watching from. Uh, so if you do get a chance, go ahead and leave where you're viewing from in the comments below. Um, we would just really love to know where we're reaching people at. For tonight's program, I'm going to be using a virtual planetarium program called Stellarium. And Stellarium is a really amazing free and open source piece of software. And that means that you can go and download it yourself and have a virtual planetarium experience right on your own home computer. You can go to stellarium.org to download it. And there's also a web version that you can use to, if you don't want to download it, you can just use it in your web browser. And this is a really great way to check out the night skies um, at, virtually and uh, allow you to plan your stargazing trips. And especially if it's cloudy or perhaps hazy due to some smoke in the air or something like that, um, you can even use Stellarium to have a virtual stargazing experience and just have fun exploring the night skies from either your location or anywhere on Earth. All right, and last but not least, this is a live program, so if you do have any questions or comments during the show, please feel free to leave those in the comments down below, and I will try to answer those as quickly as possible. I may not get to them right away, but I will have some time at the end of the show to answer any questions that you might have. And of course, if you are enjoying tonight's program, we do ask that you consider supporting the museum by making a donation of any size. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can do that by clicking on the little donate button right down below here, or you can visit our website at fcmod.org slash donate to make a donation if you're watching on YouTube or if you would just rather do it that way. And we do rely on your support to continue to bring these types of programs to you. So we would really appreciate anything that you could give. Okay, that said, let's go ahead and jump into Stellarium and check out what we can see in the night skies above us this week. Now, as you can see, we are sitting here in Fort Collins uh, at the current time. So just a little bit before sunset, the sun is going to set in about one hour tonight. So at about seven uh, just after seven o'clock tonight. And you can see the sun setting above the western horizon here. And we're going to go ahead and move time forward faster than usual so that we can get the sun to set. So we can see the stars. Let's see, here we go. And as we go, we're going to go fairly late into the night to about 1030. But notice the motion of the stars. They seem to be setting over here in the west, just like the sun and the moon do. And that's because this motion is due to the rotation of the Earth on its axis. Now, if we look to the north here and speed time up a little bit faster, you can see that the motion of the stars, oh, we're all about at 1030, seems to go in a great circle around this star right here. And this star is Polaris and it lies almost above the North Pole of the Earth. And so it seems to stay pretty much stationary throughout the night and throughout uh, ongoing nights. And uh, I pointed out a constellation last week that I called a circumpolar constellation. And that constellation was this W shape right here. And the reason it's circumpolar is because it seems to circle around Polaris without setting uh, below the horizon throughout the night. And this constellation was Cassiopeia, the queen. And I thought since I introduced Cassiopeia last week, we would introduce another character in her story 
whose name is Cepheus. And Cepheus can be found right above Cassiopeia, right here. And Cepheus is the king. So Cepheus is actually uh, Cassiopeia's husband. And he was the king of Ethiopia in Greek mythology. And Zeus placed him in the sky after his tragic death because he was descended from one of Zeus's loves, the nymph Io. Now, Cepheus ruled not the modern day Ethiopia, but the stretch of land between the southeastern Mediterranean and the Red Sea, the area that contains parts of the modern day Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. Cepheus's wife, Cassiopeia, was a very vain woman, as we talked about last week. And once she boasted that she was more beautiful than Nereids, which are sea nymphs, one of them the wife of the sea god Poseidon, which angered the nymphs and Poseidon, who then sent a sea monster, represented by the constellation of Cetus, which you can see just below them here. Now Cetus was sent to ravage Cepheus's land and Cepheus turned to an oracle for advice on how to prevent utter disaster, and the oracle told him that the only way to appease Poseidon was to sacrifice his daughter, Andromeda, which is also located in the sky right here. Desperate, Cepheus and Cassiopeia did this, leaving their daughter chained to the rock for Cetus to find. Luckily, the hero Perseus found the princess first. He rescued her and slayed the monster, and later he married Andromeda. Perseus and Andromeda were celebrating their wedding when Phineas, Cepheus's brother, turned up, claiming that she had been promised to marry him. Phineas and his followers asked that Andro Andromeda be turned over to them, but Cepheus refused them and there was a fight. Perseus tried to fight off all his opponents, but he was sorely outnumbered and he had to use the head of Medusa to turn his enemies into stone, which you can see him carrying right here. Unfortunately, the king and queen did not look away from Gor the Gorgon's head in time and were turned to stone as well. So that is the legend of uh, Cepheus and Cassiopeia. And this house-shaped constellation of stars, which is an upside-down house right now, is home to many treasures, just like we looked at with the uh, constellation of Cassiopeia. And so I thought we would point out some of those treasures now. So if you're looking up at Cepheus, you can get your evening off to a stellar start by targeting Mu Cephei, which is located right here also known as the Garnet Star. And the Garnet Star is one of the largest, most luminous supergiant stars in the Milky Way. It is one of the largest known stars with a radius of about 1,260 to 1,650 times that of the sun, and one of the largest stars visible to the naked eye. Located at an approximate distance of 2,840 light years from Earth, it is one of the most distant stars visible without binoculars. If we zoom into this region of space, we'll see that this star lies at the edge of a large star-forming nebula cataloged as IC1396, which is located at a distance of 2,400 light years from us. This nebula is perhaps best known for the portion designated uh, IC1396A, which is also nicknamed the Elephant's Trunk Nebula, and it is located right here. You guys see an elephant's trunk when you look at this shape in this nebula? I can kind of imagine an elephant, uh, an elephant's trunk in that shape. It's pretty fun. All right, let's zoom back out. And the next object that we're going to look for is known as I, uh, NGC 6946 and is located right here. 
right between the border between Cepheus and Cygnus the Swan. And if we zoom into this location, we can see that this is a galaxy. This is the Fireworks Galaxy, or, uh, or as I said, NGC 6946, and is actually a face-on spiral galaxy. It has an apparent magnitude or brightness of 9.6. And if you'll recall the magnitude scale in astronomy, the lower the number, the brighter the object, with a magnitude one being the brightest stars in the night sky. So a magnitude 9.6 is going to be fairly dim, and you're definitely going to need some sort of optical aid to see this object, such as binoculars or a telescope. This galaxy is approximately 22 million light years from Earth, and has a diameter of approximately 40,000 light years, about one third the size of the Milky Way galaxy, our own home galaxy. And it contains roughly half the number of stars as our own Milky Way. This galaxy was discovered by William Herschel in September of 1798. Zooming back out to find our next treasure of Cepheus, we're going to now locate the Wizard Galaxy, or otherwise known as NGC 7380, located right here. And if we zoom into that, we can see it's a beautiful uh, nebula. Sorry, I think I said wizard galaxy, but I meant wizard nebula. Uh, this nebula was actually discovered by Carolyn Herschel in 1787. And this cluster is embedded in a nebula, which is about 110 light years in size. The cluster is located uh, within the Milky Way galaxy and is approximately 7,000 light years distance from the solar, distant from the solar system. The stars in it are less than 5 million years old, which makes NGC 7380 a young open cluster. Open clusters are loose aggregations of dozens or hundreds of young stars, and generally speaking, they're not gravitationally bound to each other, and so they will disperse in a relatively short period of time, at least astronomically speaking. All right, and our next target is known as the Iris Nebula, Nebula and is located right here. Let's go ahead and zoom into that now. The Iris Nebula is a reflection nebula with an apparent magnitude of 6.8. The limit for naked eye viewing in the magnitude scale is usually about 5, so again, you're going to probably need at least binoculars to see this object. And uh, the Iris Nebula is approximately 1300 light years distant from us. The striking blue color of the Iris Nebula is created by light from the bright star SAO 19158, reflecting off a dense patch of normally dark dust. Not only is the star itself mostly blue, but blue light from the star is preferentially reflected by the dust, which is the same effect that makes Earth's sky blue. The brown or reddish tint of the pervasive dust comes partly from photoluminance, dust converting ultralight radiation to red light. Cataloged as NGC 7023, the Iris Nebula is studied frequently because of the unusual prevalence there of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PH, PAH, which are complex molecules that are also released on Earth during the incomplete combustion of wood fires. The bright blue portion of the Iris Nebula spans about six light years. Our next target is known as NGC 7129 and is located right here in the central part of Cepheus. NGC 7129 is another open cluster of stars and it's a star forming region located in a reflection nebula that has the shape of a rosebud. 
Now, do you guys see a rosebud when you look at the shape of this nebula? It might be kind of hard to imagine a rosebud, but let's go ahead and look at a different image of this nebula. This image was taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope and was obtained with an infrared array camera that is sensitive to invisible infrared light at wavelengths that are about 10 times longer than visible light. In this four-color composite, emission at 3.6 microns is depicted in blue, 4.5 microns in green, 5.8 microns in orange, and 8 microns in red. Here you can definitely see that rosebud shape of this nebula. This image covers a region of space that is about one quarter the size of the full moon. This cluster contains more than 130 young stars believed to be less than a million years old and is approximately 3,300 light years distant from Earth and has an apparent magnitude of 11.5. All right, well, there's just a few of the treasures located in and around Cepheus the King. I hope you can get out and check out and check out uh, Cepheus and Cassiopeia tonight and uh, really any night. As I said, these are circumpolar constellations, so they never set down below the horizon. As long as you have a good, uh, clear view of the horizon, you will be able to see these constellations. Now, the moon tonight is going to be a new moon. And what that means is that we're gonna have really dark skies, which is great for stargazing and the perfect opportunity to try to catch a rare phenomenon that happens around this time of year known as the zodiacal light. Here is a photo of this phenomenon. And what this is, is sunlight scattered off dust in our solar system and is sometimes known as the false dawn, as it might look sort of like the sun is rising, but it's not quite. You can look for this light throughout the rest of the month when moonless conditions occur. The zodiacal light typically appears as a cone-like glow centered on the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun through the sky. It appears in late summer and early fall before sunrise, earning it the name, as I said before, false dawn. And in late winter, the zodiacal light appears after sunset and is sometimes called false dusk instead. So be sure to get out early in the morning before sunrise so you can check out this zodiacal light or the sunlight reflecting off of the dust in our solar system. Just to point out a few of the planets that are in the night sky, if we look towards the east, again, it's about 1030 in my virtual planetarium here, just a little bit after. But right above Cetus, you can see this bright red-orange object. And this, of course, is the planet Mars. Mars shines big, bright, and close as it appears its, as it approaches its October 13th opposition, which is when the Earth will be directly between Mars and the Sun. However, it will cl pass closest to Earth on October 6th. And this week, as I said before, it rises in the east around the end of twilight, shining bright orange at a magnitude of negative 2.2. So much brighter than the brightest stars in the sky. Almost as bright as Jupiter, which I'll point out in just a moment. Mars climbs higher through the evening and stands at its highest and best telescope viewing at about 3 a.m. daylight savings time. Looking to the south, or excuse me, the southwest at this time, we can see two bright objects right in the line here, and these are the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is currently at a magnitude of minus 2.5, and Saturn at a magnitude of 0.3. And they shine south in the early evening and will set as the evening wears on into the dawn. 
looking back to the east and moving time forward a little bit further here let's go into the early dawn hours and we should see a bright object appearing over that eastern horizon there it is and this bright object does anyone have a guess as to what this is what planet this is well, if you guessed that this was Venus, you would be correct. Venus is the brightest object in the night sky right now at a magnitude of 4 point, or excuse me, negative 4.2, and rises in the deep darkness about two hours before dawn begins. In the east-northeast, about 20 degrees below Castor and Pollux, the twins of Gemini. are located right here. By the time uh, dawn gets underway, Venus shines fairly high in the east. And Mercury is also in our sky right now, but it's very, very close to the sunset. So it is very difficult to spot right now before it uh, dips down below that western horizon. It is bright though, so you can try to spot it about 20 minutes after sunset while twilight is still bright. All right, that brings me to the end of my show tonight. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and found some things that you might want to go check out yourself in the night sky. Once again, if anyone does have any questions, uh, feel free to post those in the comments. I will stick around for a little bit and uh, answer those questions. But if not, I hope you enjoyed the program and will join us here once again for Night Skies of Fort Collins uh, next week, as well as our other Facebook and YouTube live programs um, we have a series called Discovery Live where we bring scientists on and have conversations with those scientists and you can ask them your questions. Um, so that's a lot of fun as well as story time for the little ones. Um, so yeah, hopefully you join us for all of those future programs. I'm going to go ahead and go to the comments here and see if we have any questions. Let's see. Hi Michael, thanks for joining us from Loveland. We are, I'm in Fort Collins. Hopefully you enjoyed the program. Thanks for being here, Carol. And once again, if you did enjoy tonight's program, uh, please do consider making a donation to the museum. Uh, we are a nonprofit and we do rely on generous supporters to keep these types of programs going for you guys. Um, so if you're on Facebook Live, you can do that really easily by just clicking on the little donate button that should be right below this video. Um, and if not, you can visit fcmod.org slash donate. Yep, it's going to be a great night to look up at the stars without the moon washing out the sky. Should be able to see lots of those, uh, some of those deep sky objects. Should point out uh, one really cool one. Let's see. If we go back to about 10.30 here. Eh, nine o'clock, that works. Uh, one of the really neat deep sky objects that you can check out right now is of course the Andromeda Galaxy located right above the Andromeda, con uh, the uh, constellation of Andromeda and is located right here fairly easy object to spot with the naked eye as just this bright smudge on the in the night sky and if we zoom in we can see the full galaxy here yes carol let's hope for some clear skies tonight and this week All right, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So once again, thank you so much for joining me here for Night Skies of Fort Collins. I hope you learned something. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you keep looking up. Have a great night, everyone.